Well, good evening to our small group this evening. I'm so glad that you're all here. I know it's um, the beginning of winter. It's hard to keep track of everything, but we're very grateful that you're here. My name is Kat Parnell. I'm with Birch Bark Editing, and it is my great pleasure um, to introduce um, two really lovely, astonishing, amazing poets this evening. And uh, the first the first person is Carrie, Carrie Nassif. She's a queer poet, photographer, psychologist, and um, creativity catalyst slash life coast living in Northern New Mexico. Her chat book, Lithopedian, was one of the summer's uh, the Wardrobe's Best Dressed and a finalist in Yes, Yes, Books, Vinyl, 45 Checkbook Prize, a full-length poetry collection and or speculative memoir, Necessary and su Sufficient Conditions, The Culture Girl, is forthcoming in the summer of 2024 with Saddle Road Press. Recent work can be found in the, found in the Concision Poetry Journal Quartet, and the Colorado Review, among others, as well as several anthologies. Colorado Review, great publication. Haley. Haley is the co-founder and co-editor of the Poetry Press Beauty School Editions and the founder, editor, and designer of the literary ma magazine Concision Poetry Journal. She teaches writing and literature at colleges and universities in and around St. Paul. She also has two poetry chapbooks, uh, Where It Leads, uh, Redbird Chapbooks, and Blood and Survival, Survival Lokofo Chaps. Um, one is her premier poetry collection. Carrie, Haley, welcome, and thank you so much. Kaylee, we're looking forward to hearing you read. Yeah. Carrie. Thank you. <laughs> combination of our names is Kaylee. That yeah, works I know. Well. <laughs> so I was going to begin reading today from my chapbook, Lithopadian. Um, and what Lithopadian is, is a Greek word that translates to stone baby. Um, a Lithopadian is a rare phenomenon that occurs in a failed or ectopic um, abdominal pregnancy, and the fetus can't be reabsorbed by the mother's body. Instead, it becomes calcified to prevent infection, sepsis, or death in the mother. And uh, I could think of no better metaphor for the sacrifices that a parentified child makes to protect the well-being of its parents. And that was kind of the theme of, of this cute little book from Finishing Line Press. Um, the first poem I wanted to read today is called Manifest Legacy. In the beginning here was heat and blood, all questions or breast milk, any other was magic. We live to form our mouths into words, into tools, to fashion names, to hold back the ache, these pains in our ribs, yomping all up in our ears. Such good students. We would string up clear wire and puppet this world with myths to disguise it with Latin terms, as though we could fare any better than the creatures we destroy in our crusade to map it all out, to plaster these walls with exclamation points. The unmothering. Finally shorn of her mahogany hair, the years steamrolled flat. My sister and I untag each other's velvet ears, wondering how it must have felt for you to bleed out, to hear your pulse slow, how your beats would wane. Us, small enough to rest in your blonde arms, your feather breath on ours, seeing you stitch your own lashes back to their raw lids, undoing your old scars, each new welt we wore, how the strong white tendons of your bare hands first pulled us from your living body, then twisted rubber bands so tight around, we fell away unnoticed. Um, so the next bit I wanted to read from, from this collection is a long poem. It's a seven part poem called Pictures I Took from Space. And it was inspired by the sounds recorded in space from NASA satellites. Each section is an allusion to one of the Pleiades, the seven sisters of Greek mythology memorial memorialized in a constellation. So pictures I took from space. The midwife. Here is that distant moon. Here are its scaly scabs. It has been battered. It has, like all of us, a song. 
a sonorous wheeze of hisses and harps of lilting pitches, a swooping reach through black space, regenerative and destructive and breaking and accelerating all at once. This is her singing, chanting, lifting, opening, spreading, melding, welding, melting. And surely it is a living air inhaled and exhaled through her porous stone. Her song, it has sympathetic strings, a vibrating, a chorus of young voices, of spiraling, swirling exchanges of force as we pass with overheard words that will never be spoken. The complex. This one is the orange clattering jangle of crowds heard muffled from the window above, swooping with storming clouds. And then it is the slow sweeping stillness at the end of market. It is the call from a real horn. It bleats like the animal it was sawn from with its reverberating pulse, its wobbles of indecision, this cruxing doubt. It is the humming judgment of all that we resonate, of all we attune to. This is all, this noise, these dopplering distances, they span the icy existential ruse of isolation. No empty spaces and so many voices within. The hunted becomes the hunter. Here is one, this is us. We are transmitting like a NASCAR race, a roaring, a circular, a monotonous, a powerful, an indecisive toddler with the volume back and forth. The Fisher, a static, a humming, a teapot whistle, a slicing, a shopping cart wheel, a buzzing, a gasp. The darkness. Here, let me point it out to you, the tremulous and fading, the what began so shrill, this open beak cry calling across a humid, a low sky, a soundstage enhanced rainforest. The frog warbling, the cicada ratcheting, it is everything vibrating, it is all ricochet over a swampy, over a water rippled soundboard. This bird pleads again, this bird pleads again, this bird pleads again for the other to respond. The lightning flash. You cannot see it, but this, it is a singular, an ocean wave, a boiling tsunami maker cresting and fractalating. This, this is a lone plane flying overhead, gliding into a deep well, the resounding, the nothing, and into the sea, into itself. And the last clad. But here, this is a piccolo humming, a kazoo made from the cercerating backs of insect wings, a wavering heartbeat, a perpetual boomerang returning and departing, hidden in a seashell wish, a headache throb, a message microscoped in tears, the giddy rush of room to grow from tending inner space. And then I wanted to read to you just a few poems from my forthcoming book, The Necessary and Sufficient Conditions, The Vulture Girl, with Saddle Road Press this summer. Um, this is called The Vulture Girl Wasn't Born a Bird. But she did begin life, like all of us, an egg. She began this all as one small egg and split into two. She was not the vulture girl, not yet. She was only twins, just the two perfectly mirrored bodies who shared the sacred sack in which they were wrapped. They shared it all, but shared it slant. The one who would become the vulture girl outpaced the one who would not, and the one who would not became stillness herself, became silent, fetid, deaf. And the one who would become a vulture girl, the one who set her breath by their heart's beat, who would never harm her only twin, did what only a scavenger is there to do. The vulture girl becomes the vulture girl as she breathes in her sister's cells, her other selves. She purifies the charnel grounds of this one's womb, the other's tomb. A small imprint on a left foot of the little wing she lived with and the little wing she died alongside. A birthmark marker for bodies lost and won. A wingspan that could have circled and circled and circled the sun.
then I have spooky action at a distance. If you ask quantum physics, it will tell you everything is just a matter of scale. It can't say exactly if you and your vanishing twin are entangled or not. But when particles share space in such a way that they cannot be described independently, then observing one causes an irreversible collapse within the other. And I wonder, what is a collapse without a hope for consolidation of the rubble? Okay. And the last one I want to read today is called Fawning. She builds the fawn around her of sticks felled in the brisk winds from the old cottonwood, each limb barkless, creamy, smooth, each set of legs set at, set at a skittish, an awkward angle. The girl fashions a hide of worn thin chicken wire wrapped around her sharpest corners and plied in layers of paper mache, pulped from the scrapbook pages grandma made for him. Handwritten captions in that square and even cursive for her firstborn that first year before the first set of twins, stiff photo squares pulling off from their dark yellow tape moorings. Brown newsprint, toasted with time, deckled at the edges with neglect, she coos softly, almost purrs to herself, as she works the paste into the paper strips, into the spaces still left or torn open, into whatever else will hide her from this cage of her own making. She weaves a small broom of her old stitches and sweeps up the bottle caps, shards of plastic, stripped cigarette filters, walnut hulls, pebbles, and metal springs left behind. She makes a bedding of it. She tucks her cold feet up into her layers as the fawn is marionetted about, is buffeted on the prevailing whims of others. She is lulled into a sort of slumber by the erratic rocking, by the loving knocking, by the goings on outside of her pinata skin. Haley? This is from my book one. And this is the first time I get to read from the physical copy. Uh, and Carrie's adult spawn designed the cover. <laughs> and I, I cannot tell you how many people have commented on how amazing the cover is and how it's making them excited about the book. So here we go. Eyes close the side of the road crows pick. Eyes open meat under the skin. Eyes close a burn bruise. Eyes open the side of the road with no shoulder. Eyes close silken feathered perforations. Eyes open the parallel soil drop. Eyes close a charcoal rain copter. Eyes open the side of the road crows pick. Eyes ink the stain of accelerant. Eyes shoulder the hardly out of place. The layers of death keep reversing. A story told from one eye to the next turns its content away after the meal of fish bone lies wet on dirt shadow. Lift of light glimp a lodge of warm saliva, purples against gummy hidden irrigation. One sees through cough the mist around tree spider, ghost veining what drought fairies but won't take. Little parachute of talons kept the fall secret. Folded spectral stems over eyes Teeth lax at center, remove the taste of sight. Crave dirt in the broken belly. Plastic puddles move to face the light, the light. What light reflects halves of ghosts? Smallish needles pierce grass roots. Fence a worry center into artificial pink. 
So for me, <laughs> as I was um, in 2015, I was feeling overwhelmed with the news cycle covering the presidential election. It was the summer of 2015, and I was so overwhelmed with it. And I had been a huge news junkie before this moment. I had to find a way to pull away from the drama of it and, and try to imagine what's happening in the rest of the world that's not engaged in this human drama because there, there felt very seriously to me a rest of the world that wasn't about this story that was going back and forth between us. And the rest of the world was being impacted by what was happening and what had been happening and what was going to happen. And so for me, it felt very important to try and get inside that perspective. And this is the experiment with how I did that. Reverse an empty clasp of insulation. Entrails speared with wind, brush, accordion, waxing gibbous moonlight upon the grass clipped pond cover. Broken fuse, worn smooth, irrigates a burn flow from street light to chop a cord of tail, warns the machinery easy until it isn't. Genes tune themselves in three harmonies of protected lies. Blue stones shaved and curled in a pan, in the spirit of glacier in a lake, in the leg left over, in pricks of blood along the edge, in the point where dawn currents a vibration, either smooth or jagged, it names itself an unbroken. Each shape limbs out wood grain, resurrects the truncated sunrise, catching needles in midair. Saw hand of the trunk spreads from shoulder in flight, in body's concentric rings, areola, Linea negra, umbilical, the lungs suspend in winter hollows, hold antlers away from the buck. Spreading comfort boils the iron, dithering in contemporary cattails. The curled birch bark doesn't spiral how the twig does. Purr of mistake is out of direction. The white flag a fawn kitten, cardboard, fully absorbed by rain. The gutter still bears a few plumulous letters, contented, in curl frond, claw piercing grass. Some message or other made to choose, or not choose, but run. So part of the way that I was able to come into this uh, technique for imaging was to imagine each page or each, and at that point I was working on them as though they're separate poems. Now, the more I read from it, um, and I've done a lot of readings in the last two months, uh, I, I am like really intimately aware that this is just one poem. <laughs> but as I was writing it, it felt like different poems. And as I was crafting them, I was imagining that there was a central image. And it, not all of the pages contain those same central images, but I was imagining a central image. And as I was trying to work that image, I was trying to think about it, not in terms of narrative, because if I, because a narrative is a human construct. And so if I were trying to remove that perspective, how could I begin to see the world if not through narrative, if not through chronology? And I began to look at it directionally. So the central image became like, a, like looking at a compass. And if the central image in a poem was the possum, then for me and my relationship with it, what was true north? And if that was playing dead, then what was opposite that? What was, what was pointing south? And that might be dreaming. And then as I'm crafting the poem, I, I get to kind of play with and come upon, well, then, then what's east and west? What's intersecting that image? Florid commification, conjoined with a vanishing rustle slope, teetering on a melody. Flick of might then, 
frayed silence naps to shudder possum tail. If wind chooses just one branch, sagging in the song ship, buried palms prick to plummet in the bark strands divergent from cord pool, blue, or night blue or mirror motion. The ground door neither opening nor closing. The inside of eyelids switch yellow on wall or claws holder or jacket though off. Beasts the screen to triple, a furtive growl or a slice up, prairie drop seed, whistles for the soil. Follow a smooth heart, however hatched. Half emptied balloon choosing bounce over roll to be filled again with milkweed. Contemptuous to the forecast, half scribble faded, how the heart and ribcage take communion of each other. Congenial syncopation of pendulum and mineral, a wire path then, careful of hatch crack, igniting mazes frayed in semblance of hard time. Polyangular corpse of a thing, smeared under canopy digits, glottal and whispering to a mother, I am stuck. There is an eye. Carrie, how did you how did you prepare to read your poems tonight? Or how do you prepare to read poems any night? First of all, I wanted to say that was amazing. And I love the explanations of of that. I love the notion of the compass. But um how I prepare is usually I get really excited and then I get really, really anxious. Um and then, <laughs> and then I read through all of my work. I'm like, okay, so what is the is the short form of this that I feel like saying? So I pay attention to like the mood of the audience that I imagine um, and try to come up with something that still has some kind of a theme to it in my head. I don't know if that comes out or not when I read it, but um, yeah. And then I try to like, as I'm reading, I try to stay here, <laughs> just try to stay in my sort of solar plexus and kind of stay grounded. But um, I probably had five or six different versions of what I was going to read today about two hours ago. And <laughs> it just, this is how it came out. Yeah. How, how That's funny because when we were like chatting earlier, I was like, what are you going to, it was like an hour and you're like, ah, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm like, yeah, me too. Um, but no, it's, it is funny because like for this book, especially it feels very different. Um, it feels very different because it's just one poem. And so I'm, I feel like I'm reading like a section. There was a while where I didn't do that. And now I'm just reading sections of it. And like, I almost skipped around tonight and then I didn't. But then I was thinking about that too, because when you started reading, you read from two different collections and you said, and I want to just call you out on one thing <laughs> as, you said, as you're getting ready to read from Lithopedia and you're like, here's a, here's a, you call it, I think you called it a cute little book or something like that. And I like started laughing because I'm like, oh, because I thought it was devastating. <laughs> like, I wouldn't have called it cute. I would have called it devastating. But I thought it was good. It was a good description. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, Haley and I have known each other since probably about 2015. No. Yeah. It might be that long. Wait, it's been a while. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I was going to ask you, when we first met, you um, were attempting to write poetry without that narrative. And I was going to ask you what that was about, um, but now I have a better sense of that. But then how many iterations did it take for you to get here? Because you were really struggling with it back then. Yeah, I was really struggling with it for a long time. These poems, um, this, sort of, this sort of technique started in 2015 and I had like three poems. <laughs> and for a real long time, I had three poems. And I, I was, for a long time, I was calling them the no people poems <laughs> because all of the poems didn't have, no, there were, weren't any people in it. It was a lot of like dripping sinks and like exploding pipes and stuff like that, which is still a fascination of mine. Um, and then there were a lot of like periodic elements and just weird, and they were like poems about these things. And then, um, I don't even know. I probably had three different iterations before we went to Coleraine where we met. And then I had a bit different one that I was working with for about a year. And then working with Rusty Morrison, 
I mean, it's like one of the best things I think I've ever done is just to hire her as a consultant and to say like, look at, <laughs> look at this mess and tell me what you think. And um, she was the perfect read. And I had a lot of readers look at it and I got a lot of really valuable feedback. So this is not um, a knock on any of my writers groups who all really helped me a lot. But for some reason, the way she saw it was just similarly similar enough to the way I wanted to see it that nobody had seen before. And she told me so many things that I have not been able to use in any way. <laughs> but this one comment she said, which was in these, especially in these three poems, I see that you're using surrealism, but it's not metaphorical. And my mind just exploded because every way I'd been relating to surrealism had been metaphorical. I hadn't had an experience with surrealism that was not metaphorical. And I was like, do you mean it's like Dada? And she's like, no, no, there is definitely meaning in here. She's like, I don't know what it is. And that's going to be like your task is to figure it out. And it did take me about three months to kind of get a hold of the fact that I was like really trying to like disjoint a reader from from predicting what the next word would be or predicting what might happen. That mm -hmm. I was like really trying to remove. That was how I could get the human out of it. And from there, it was like, oh, I got it. <laughs> I know what to do now. But um, that was like 2019. So, you know, four years of even trying to send those poems out and not getting them published because I just didn't have a context for them. And so I'm sure I wasn't confident in how I was sending them or where I was sending them. I didn't know where to send them. It's interesting because the experience of, of reading your your book and the whole, the whole manuscript, it is really disjointed, but it's also grounded in such specific rooted imagery that you don't really feel like you're being abandoned but you just don't know where you're going and that is probably the only way you can take the human out of linear time or, or that sort of thing so I, I feel like it's really effective and it's beautiful which leads me to another question so I know that you're a gardener like you're, <laughs> you're an excessive gardener maybe <laughs> yeah. that's, that's real like and when you say that just to like Yesterday morning, one of my neighbors, who's also a big gardener, left this giant like grocery bag full of seed catalogs on my front step, just in case. So yeah, obsessive gardener is about right. That's yeah, yeah. So I know that you're not making all of these observations. That that where do you get all this imagery from? How do you explain this this um, close observation of nature? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, and this is like. I think it really took until this phase in my life to understand it. But when I look back at my life, it feels like such a clear path. And I remember being five years old and going with a walk for a walk with my parents and walking by a lilac bush, a giant lilac bush and being like, mom, what is that thing? <laughs> like, I was like, what is that thing? And you know, with that beautiful scent and bloom. And she said, oh yeah, it's lilac. And she says, we actually have one in the back of our backyard. And I remember her taking me back and it was like dusk and it was just like, oh, the smell was so intense. And it was, and it was my moment for like, now I love plants. <laughs> and so, and so I would always ask as a kid, like, what is that? Or like, if a bird was flying by and like, singing a song, I would be like, what is that bird? I always wanted to know. And even when I went to college in my dorm, my grandma sent me a plant and a bird feeder that stuck to the outside of my dorm window because I just like, it was just like a part of me, which I didn't, which I didn't know until a few years ago when I lived in a, in a condo where the association changed and they wouldn't let us feed birds anymore. And I was like, I was like riotous. I was like, oh, what are you talking about? <laughs> we have to feed the animals. We have to like, we've taken their homes. We have to support them. <laughs> like, it was, yeah, it was, it was kind of a mess actually. But now I live somewhere else. And so I can do whatever the fuck I want. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Which um, is kind of like a question I wanted to ask you in terms of doing whatever the fuck you want. Because... <laughs> Because one thing that I love about, and so now I've gotten to read a couple of your collections and some other experiments. I'm like, <laughs> I know you're ready for this question, I'm so but I'm not sure other people are. <laughs> so I'm just going to ask it straight out, okay? The buff of Carrie, <laughs> Carrie, how do you negotiate the way capitalism is so diametrically opposed 
to the kind of poetry you write. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Okay. So <laughs> my turn. like, I kind of feel that capitalism and poetry don't always, you know, mesh anyway, because it's like competitive and it's profit driven. And if any of us are lucky enough, I'm going to say lucky enough to be a poet. There's really not, it's not a lucrative thing, but it's not something you can give up either. Um, yeah. I, 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 I think that it is so, I almost feel like it's a kind of a re rebellion against on some level. It's like, so I'm, I'm, I'm paying attention to tiny little moments. Like on Facebook, I have a everyday today's miracles or something. These tiny little moments that would get, you know, run over with a Mack truck if, if, if capitalism had its way. But I'm like, here's this tiny little piece that we preserve that's still important. Or here's this connection to myself, or here's this connection to other people. I'm trying to like, counterbalance this frenetic like I'm a therapist and so I can't tell you how many clients I have that I'm like no hun you're fine your environment is you know aft right it's just you know and so I don't want to be complicit and say well here let's let's get you some therapy so that you can adjust to a really unhealthy system no it's an unhealthy system and we need to just kind of know that a lot of the times and so this is kind of a a, a back to centering with like our humanness or our animalness or our connectedness or our spirit or whatever word you want to use that's I, I feel like that's the only way that it makes sense. Because yeah. how else would you spend hours and hours and hours working on, you know, uh, some dumb piece of paper that maybe 17 people will read? I mean, it makes no sense if you were in it for the money, you know? Yeah. But even the subject matter feels really outside. And, um, I, and you know, like I've been, what was, I just, I don't know. A couple of years ago, there was this book, uh, Okay, all I can think is it's got like a peach and green cover. It's a Ray Armentrout book. That's in the nether room. <laughs> but but there are all these mentions of like currency and coins. And I was so I was so excited that she was talking about it because I felt like a lot of people weren't talking about it. But then as soon as I read it, I started actually noticing it in a lot of other work, how like even the subject matter is mm -hmm. really, you know, like like the relationships become transactional or there's something that's happening inside of the poetics that feels maybe unconsciously rooted in capitalism. And just, I don't feel that at all in your work. Like it really feels like a new kind of culture that I get to step inside and like oh, I take a breath that. from, right? Yeah. yeah, it does feel kind of transgressive. It's like, so I'm writing a poem or I'm writing a book about motherhood, but it's about ugly motherhood. You know, it's about being poorly mothered and, and sometimes poorly mothering. And so it is- But there's still love in it, you know? Like, it's not like- it's, it's not like slamming the mother. It's like, it's like, here's difficult things that we need to kind of acknowledge. There's a poem I wrote recently, and it was talking about how love doesn't conquer fear. That's not her language. Like love is more about like, let's look at the fear and hold it together with love. And then we can kind of look at it. And that's, I think what I'm trying to do. Here's these emotional things we're all experiencing. And a lot of them are because of horrible things. And, and yet how can we kind of, um, how can we transcend? And I think that's what we need to do in order to, but it is, who writes a book about a vulture and a twin and a rabbit guy? I mean, it's just, it's, it's true. Constellations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like the, the, the new one, the vulture girl. I'm like, what? I don't even know. This doesn't, nobody's going to understand it, but, um, but it's not written for a market. It's written for the human soul. I yeah. think. Yeah. I love yeah. It. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it just, it feels like a key for me inside of your work. Um, and, and then it also makes me think about like how much wisdom is involved in writing something like that and how like a younger self would have seen it a different way. Yeah. Cause you and I both, we started writing not in our youth, <laughs> not to say that we're not completely youthful now, but yeah. when we some you know battle scars and we have it took a while to get to it I don't think I started writing lithopedian until my kiddo was out of high school and I had space in my head for other things but I think it took that long for me to know myself enough to know that there was something I wanted to say you know I mean I love that there are young people out there who do have a sense of like here's my here's my piece of the world that I'm going to convey and there's so many talented writers out there it's amazing but that wasn't me I had, I was so lost. It took me so long to figure out, to kind of fall into myself. Yeah. Even like into my thirties, I feel like I was still 
I was still doing a performance of being feminine. You know, like I still, I felt like I was trying to like match some image that somebody wanted me to be mm-hmm. until I was in my, like pretty deeply into my forties, you know, like it's really, and I think in terms of writing poetry, it's very hard to address your deeper wisdom when you're trying to be something, when you're trying to fit somebody else's image of you. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think wisdom is that, that authenticity. It, I mean, it, it comes from listening to, you know, your, your entire self that includes your whole body, not just the part of your body that fits the standards or not just the part of your mind that, that gets good grades. It's, it's about embracing all of it. I feel like. Yeah. What I know yeah. about wisdom right now, who knows 20 years from now, what I would think about wisdom might be a little different, but. Yeah. Well, yeah. Cause now it's still another phase of life. It's not like we've arrived and here we are. <laughs> now We can be poets right now. It's like, here we are. <laughs> we've done all this stuff. We see all this stuff. And we also have these responsibilities, which we didn't have in our twenties and well, you had more in your thirties than maybe I did. <laughs> but, yeah, I had like very few responsibilities in my thirties, and so <laughs> yeah, I had a lot more time to be. And I was I was writing. I just didn't know. I didn't really care about publishing. Like I didn't know like that was like an important thing. If you wanted to have conversations with poets, like you also need to like be part of that conversation. You can't just like walk up to people and be like, "Hey, let's be friends." <laughs> I mean, you can, but it doesn't work real well. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> Right. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. How do you do that? Yeah. And I wasn't, um, um, I was a psychology major. I I got a, you know, advanced degree in psych. I hadn't taken a creative writing class ever. And so it takes a while to figure out how am I going to be a a contributing citizen or a member of, of this. And, and, and I I kind of feel like an imposter sometimes because I'm like, I kind of cheated. I mean, I I helped with thesis and dissertation. Like I, I can do that, but yeah yeah so I kind of came in sideways so that was an interesting way and I think maybe it took till I was in my late 40s and 50s to kind of go okay yeah, I do have some legitimate legitimate legitimacy yeah um it took that I think to figure it out yeah but but then now you also have like these other responsibilities that you have to you know like complete or like you have like on a daily basis and and you're trying to make a writing life happen yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, there's probably months where I don't write hardly anything at all. And then there's other months where I'm like submitting, submitting, submitting. It kind of feels like it, it ebbs and flows. It's this really different rhythm. And uh, I think like all creative work is kind of like that. You've got this incubation period and then you've got the productivity period and, and various stages in between. And it's been interesting to kind of trust that that's going to continue and keep coming back and that I'll make time. I'll go to a residency and that's where I'll do all the work. And in the meanwhile, I'm writing fragments of stuff that'll eventually go with me and I'll make something out of it. It's, it's taken a while to learn how my body and mind want to do that. Cause it wasn't, it's strange that it isn't intuitive. Yeah. But I mean, do you find though you end up in a flow where you're like, okay, now, now I'm just, I have lines in my head, so I'm going to write it down. And, and other times it's not that other times it's, yeah, you have to kind of force it a little bit. Yeah. Or open up to something different so that I can kind of sneak in sideways. Like there's a meditation class that I go to in the morning sometimes. And it's like, if I don't, if I'm not in a real writer mood, she'll come up with a prompt and I'll have done some like meditation and I'll have something will come out. And I don't know that it's ever going to end up in a book, but it, it, it's one of those fragments that's going with me in those notebooks when I go to my next residency. This is an amazing conversation. It's just so generative and it's giving me, um, I don't write poetry, but it's giving me so many ideas about how to connect with, you know, who we are, the forces outside us, the forces that we choose to engage with, um, and how, just how we interact with all of that. So my question, and it'll be the the, the final question for, for, the, for the evening here, is what okay. what what piece of advice would you give to someone who is young and thinks they want to write poetry what what would you what would you tell them go for it (laughs) okay good well so yeah so a lot of what I do is teach college students so I get this question a lot (laughs) I get this question a lot and um just the number one thing that I try to let my students know is that this is not 
you're never going to, well, <laughs> not never, but it's so super rare that you choose to be a poet and then that's what you do with your whole life. So, you, so it's important to reframe the way that you think about this and not think about becoming a famous writer because that's like not part of our culture, really. <laughs> you know, like it's not like even a lot of people who know who Stephen King is have never read any of this. <laughs> so it's like not a thing to be thinking about being a writer. What's more important is trying to figure out how to live an artful life and how to be able to come back to the page when you're feeling like you're not quite yourself. It's not about accomplishment. It's about being with yourself. The, both of both, um, you know, both pieces of advice um, are are excellent. Um, you know, Carrie says go for it, and Haley says be with yourself, and that really is the only way forward as an artist is that you have to go for it, but you also have to be with yourself. We've been with you this evening, and I am just really grateful to both of you. The readings were superb. I encourage those of you who are watching or who are here right now to please support writers by purchasing their books. Sorry, Carrie, capitalism. But, you know, these things matter. What is on the shelf matters. And so we encourage you to, um, to support the arts um, in any way that you can. The holidays are coming. Two really good books that we talked about tonight. Go ahead and purchase them. And thank you, everyone, for participating this evening. Thank Can you. I just, thank you, Carrie. Carrie, yeah. was that your answer to tell young writers to go for it, or were you telling me to go for it? <laughs> I maybe misunderstood what was happening. Oh no, I, I, okay. I, I think that if you if if you don't start writing and hear learn your own voice, you're not going to be able to learn your own voice. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> it's brilliant. It's brilliant. You know, you you to to learn your own voice, you have to be in a room by yourself for a moment and speak out loud, so that you can hear what the noise what what the noise is, what echoes, what's lyrical, what what has meter, and what matters. You two matter. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.